Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to Canterbury Gardens Community Church. My name is Shabu. I'm one of the pastors here at Canterbury. If you're visiting our YouTube channel for the very first time, thanks for taking the time to check us out. If you call Canterbury home, we deeply miss you and we look forward to, as restrictions ease over time, that we will be able to gather. But firstly and foremost, we know that if you are a follower of Jesus, this is not the church, right? It's just an empty building. The church is the people of God. So maybe today you're meeting with friends and families uh, around this TV screen or computer screen, however you're watching this stream. We pray that you'll be encouraged as you uh, experience hospitality and love together uh, as we worship Jesus Christ. If you're someone who's exploring again, uh, we pray that Jesus will continue to reveal to you that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, get your communion cup and your juice and um, biscuit or bread ready as we share in communion. Kids, listen up. There's going to be a great little kids section. You may hear a cock a doodle do in there. That's for you to listen to. And finally, we will hear from Mike uh, as we unpack John 18. With that in mind, I'm going to pray for us as we sing, as we consider. Uh, And as we worship our great King, the Lord Jesus Christ, let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We pray that wherever we are right now, that you would reveal more of yourself to us, whether if we are a follower or a seeker, make our hearts realize more and more that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We pray this in your mighty name. So church, let's worship our great King. To the King of glory and light, all praises to the only giver of life, our Maker. The gates are open wide, we worship you. Come see what love has done, amazing, he bought us with his blood, our Savior, the cross has worship you.
Jesus invites me to call him Father. Only
Uh, good morning, Canterbury Gardens. It's Russell here, and it's my privilege this morning to deliver the communion focus this Sunday morning. I want to start by telling a, a story that uh, seems like a long time ago, an eternity ago, but it was only last summer. And uh, we were at our house having a swim. It was a hot day. We had a few people over, family, uh, the kids, the grandkids. And uh, Holly's sitting by the pool. She's talking to a niece of mine called Jacinta. And Jacinta's tiny, I mean seriously tiny, like Shabu, Sister Sharon, small. And uh, Holly and Jay get along absolutely fantastically. Anyway, they're sitting having a chat. And um, Jay suddenly turns her head and yells out to her mum and says something. And I see Holly looks at him and goes, Jay, is Auntie Helen your mum? And Jay goes, yeah. And Holly goes, what do you need a mum? Like she's almost 30. And Jay goes, oh, Holly, what do you need a mum? And Holly goes, I can't drive. It's like, it seems so logical. There's a need there. And in that funny little quirky story, when I think back on it, there's actually a couple of really good key things I just want to draw out. On one hand, you've got a view that I'm incapable. I need a relationship. I can't do this and I'm bonded to my parents. And then on the other hand, you've got the other view of I'm big, I'm capable, I'm adequate, I can do this and I might as well do this on my own. Now when we come to communion, for us believers, we reflect on the fact that at a certain point in time, we made a decision that we're actually incapable of restoring the relationship back with God, our Creator. We acknowledge He exists, we don't know how to do it, and we have to just give up, put our hands up and say, I need a Lord and I need a Saviour. I want it restored and I can't do this on my own. And what a significant moment that is when God inspires us to get to that point. And isn't it an amazing thing when we look at the world today that basically, and even us at times when we continue to fail, it's because we're in the driver's seat. We're the ones going down our path, driving away what we want to do, disconnected. What we need to do is just stop and think and praise God that he sent Jesus to be our Lord and Saviour, to actually go through the sacrifice of giving his life on our behalf so that we can be made right with God. We look at the world and it just seems to be going off in a certain direction and at times we get drawn to it as well. In our study group that we do with the boys on a Tuesday morning, and that's an open invitation to any of the lads in the church that want to join us, because um, we're Zooming, Shubb said, let's let's just find the psalm instead of doing the book and let's just pull it apart. And Good old Chubbs, what does he do? He pulls a longer psalm for us to study. I think he's got an inside word on how long this COVID might take, but let's hope it's not too long. We're actually doing Psalm 119, and you look at um, King David, he says in Psalm 119, verse 33, Teach me, Lord, the ways of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. Direct me in your paths of your commands. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. And isn't that what we do when we take the wheel of our own car in our life without the relationship that God calls us to be in? The communion, we celebrate we celebrate what Jesus did for us, drawing us back to him and making right the relationship with God. Each time we celebrate, we take the cup. We remember the blood that was shed. We take the bread for the body that was broken on our behalf for the times that we want to be in control. Let me pray. Let's share the symbols together and enjoy the rest of the service. Lord, thank you. Thank you for paying the price on our behalf. May you be the driver of our life in all aspects. Help us to stay strong and connected to you behind the wheel in our life, that we stop wanting the desire 
to take that and drive it in the direction. And when we do, help us to reflect and come back again and again to the sacrifice that you gave us to give us life. And may we be then a vessel where we can actually go ahead and impact those around us to reflect on the sacrifice you gave and the importance of not heading down a path that leads to destruction and ultimate death. And we want to have a path that takes us to eternal life. We offer all this up in your name. Amen. Let's share. Hi everybody, my name is Shelley. I would like to usher you all into the Lord's presence as we pray together. As I was asking the Lord how we should pray, Exodus 15 verse 2 came to mind. This is where Moses said, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. It was right after God had miraculously rescued the Israelites from the Egyptian army by parting the Red Sea. So, let's pray according to the elements of this verse. The Lord is my strength. We will pray about physical things. The Lord is my song. We will pray about things of the heart, emotions, or mental state. And He has become my salvation. We will pray for situations needing the Lord's solution. So, join me now and let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are our strength. Lord, we lift up to you the physical needs of our church community and our nation and the world we live in. We pray for those who are sick and hurting physically. We ask for your touch of healing and strength and endurance. Lord, there are some in our congregation that have had injuries some are struggling with long-term chronic pain or physical handicaps, and some with horrible diseases. Lord, would you give each one of these a special touch from you? Would you ease their pain and strengthen their immune systems? Would you provide help and assistance and solutions for these physical problems? Lord, thank you that you are our song you lift our spirits when we are down. You are the joy that we feel. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting emotionally, those who are afraid, depressed, confused, anxious, and feel alone. Lord, would you give these people encouragement, direction, trust, peace, calmness, and a sound mind? Would you wrap them in your arms and give them a special hug from you this week? Will you make us, your children, aware if someone is hurting around us and give us what we need to be able to reach out to them? Lord, you are our salvation, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Thank you that you care about our situations, that you are the God who sees us in our predicaments. Lord, there are those in our congregation that are experiencing tough circumstances. Lord, would you help them in their trouble? Would you provide miraculous solutions to their problems? Would you give them direction, provide jobs, provide counsel, provide housing, provide care? Lord, we pray for the situation that is all over the news, all over the world, there is much fear and uncertainty in the world. There are many losing jobs or businesses, and some countries are losing the value of their currency. Lord, would you intervene? Would you help these people? And would you use this situation to draw people to yourself? Would you use your followers to reach out to those around and cause many to come to salvation? We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Thank you that you love each of us and care about our situations. 
We love you, Lord. Amen. Hello, Pastor Tim here. Hey, Pastor Tim. No, 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 you're not bothering me at all. Yeah, we can give any of the things you like. Sure, I have to go now. Bye. Okay, see ya. Oh, hi, everybody. Today's Kids Church talk will be Peter the Rooster. Bye. <laughs> is brave Peter. You can tell that Peter is brave because he has a tattoo. Not a sticker tattoo that washes off in the bar, but a real tattoo. Ooh. Peter must be brave. These are chickens. Chickens do not have tattoos. Peter is a fisherman. He sails in dangerous storms and catches dangerous fish. Peter must be brave. Chickens do not have dangerous jobs. Have you ever heard of a fisher chicken? The hen's job is to lay eggs. The rooster's job is to wake everyone up in the morning. Cock a doo doo! While Peter's real name is Simon, which is a very nice name, his friends call him Peter, which means rock. Rocks are tough, so Peter must be brave. Chickens have names like Speckle or Chooky Chook. Speckle and Chooky Chook are not tough names. So you probably think that Peter is always brave, has never been scared, and is definitely not a chicken. And if you think you could never be brave like Peter, then listen closely as Peter and the rooster tell you their story. It was the last supper time when Jesus sat down with his friends. Tonight, said Jesus, I will be arrested and you will all run away. I will never run away, said John. I will stick with you to the end, said James. I will die for you, said Peter. Peter, said Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny that you are my friend. Not once, not twice, but three times. Never! Never! cried Peter. I am brave, I am not scared, and I am definitely not a chicken! chicken. Later that night, as they prayed in the garden, soldiers arrested Jesus. John ran away. James ran away. But was Peter brave? Was Peter scared? Was Peter a chicken? He drew his sword. Slash! And then ran away. The soldiers took Jesus to the house, the high priest. But Peter was brave. He was not a chicken and he followed. Halt! Who goes there? asked the girl guarding the gate. Are you a follower of Jesus? No, said Peter. Jesus is not my friend. Once inside, Peter joined a group huddled around the fire. Something smells fishy. Are you one of those fishermen who follows Jesus? No, no, said Peter. I've never been fishing in my life. Jesus is not my friend. Didn't I see you in the garden with a sword? You're a follower of Jesus. No, 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 yelled Peter. Jesus is not my friend. Then the rooster crowed. <laughs> 
Jesus looked at his friend Peter. And Peter ran out of the gate and cried and cried and cried. What a sad story. Then how did Peter change from being a chicken to being a brave friend of Jesus? Well, that's another story. See you next week. John chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the disciples of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, 
Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release you, the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Well, good morning, church family. If you are a visitor online with us this morning, we extend a warm welcome to you also. Well, it's only with a slight hint of bias as a result of the excellent Bible reading from some of the members of one of my favourite small groups here at Canterbury Gardens that you'll be well aware we're looking at John chapter 18 together this morning. The previous five chapters Jesus spends during the Passover feast preparing the disciples for what was to come, for the events that would quickly unfold and leave them confused, alone and scared. He had washed their feet, told them a new commandment, that they love one another. Give them words to comfort, inspire and remind them in their time of need. Jesus promised them the Holy Spirit, told them what to expect in the future. And he prayed for them, and not only for them, but for all who would follow after them. Well, chapter 18 starts like a freight train. It's unique to find such a narrative in all four Gospels. The betrayal, arrest, trial... Peter's denial and Jesus being brought before Pilate are recorded in some detail in all four of the Gospels. So the obvious question is why? Of all the things that all four Gospel writers could share about Jesus and his life, why is this period so important to them? As we go through this chapter together, that question I would ask that you have in the back of your mind because it's likely God is trying to get our attention, don't you think? It's often in the stressful, trying times of life we all go through where we can learn something of where our heart is at. If we're willing to be honest with ourselves, it's during frustration, when we're under pressure or perhaps in conflict with someone, that something of our true self comes out. My wife read a book a number of years ago and it was described like this, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. It's during times of stress, pressure, frustration that the true heart is exposed And sometimes it isn't all that pleasant. It can be as simple as wanting to get somewhere and being stuck in traffic. I confess that's me at times. Perhaps the kids have been pushing our buttons all day. Work is expecting more of us than it should. There's a disagreement with your spouse, money pressures, a relationship fracturing, or any other number of issues. Some significant, others perhaps not so. Is being stuck in traffic really up there with the list of trials in life that I should lose my cool over? If I'm honest with myself, there are times when what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. And as I look back on those times, it isn't always pretty. James 3 describes it like this. The tongue is like a forest fire. All creatures can be tamed, but who can tame the tongue? He goes on to say, can salty pond produce fresh water? James points to bitterness, jealousy, and selfish ambition being at the heart of what kind of water, fresh or putrid, we produce. John chapter 18 reveals each of these human traits warts and all. We'll see bitterness, jealousy, and selfish ambition welling up from within the hearts of those who interact with Jesus. This is a chapter that we could comfortably spend many weeks going through as we examine the final hours of Jesus' life. But the plan for today is to deal with the entire chapter. So what I'd like to do is to give us a helicopter view of what's going on. In this chapter, Jesus interacts with a variety of characters and we'll soon learn more about them. As the pressure on Jesus ramps up, his responses are measured, 
deliberate and at total odds with those around him. Nothing takes him by surprise, catches him off guard. He's not some naive martyr caught in the moment. No, he's an authoritative saviour. As I've read through this chapter the last few weeks, it is the tragic blindness of those talking to him that has stood out to me. I'd like to share that with you this morning. The first character we meet is during Jesus' arrest. Judas, a follower of Jesus, a disciple, one of the twelve, a man who sat under the most powerful, charismatic man to have ever lived. Judas, who saw the dead raised to life, multitudes fed with a loaf and a few fish. Here's a man who sat under teaching such as no one had ever heard before, as one who had authority, we're told. A man who walked, talked, ate and communed with God incarnate. A man who was devoid of faith. A betrayer who in the end would take his own life out of sorrow. Here's a bitter man. His hopes and dreams were not realised. What's down in the well is finally brought to light. Here we witness the reality that not everyone who calls himself a disciple is truly born again. Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus says there are those who have been involved in ministry for many years for him. And he will say, I never knew you. Even those who had prophesied, cast out demons and done many incredible things for him. In Matthew 7, Jesus says that ultimately, over time, the storms of life come. And as those storms come, the true foundation of our faith is exposed. The bitterness of Judas's expectations not being met led to an action that no one except Jesus could have ever seen. Well, as we move on in our chapter, from verses 12, we're introduced to Annas and Caiaphas. Though Caiaphas was the high priest at the time, it was widely regarded that his father-in-law Annas was the real power behind the role of the high priest and they are thus both recorded as being high priest at various occasions. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that five of his sons were also high priests after him. The concern of these men was keeping the letter of the law, not the intent. What do I mean by that? Well, God asked people to rest on the Sabbath. But they took that to mean that you couldn't do nothing on the Sabbath. In fact, the purpose of the Sabbath was so that God could provide a physical rest for the people, but also provide an opportunity for them to come aside and commune with their God. They washed their hands ritualistically. They didn't eat certain things. They said the longest prayers in public. They dressed themselves to look righteous. They judged others by their own standards, placing expectations on others they themselves failed to meet teaching as doctrines the commandments of man. I remember hearing a podcast from Chuck Swindle where he shared that when he had decided to begin a new ministry in a new area, he preferred to start from scratch rather than work with an existing church congregation. The reason, as he described it, was that most well-established churches were full of grace killers. Well-meaning people who had lost the wonder the joy, the freedom of experiencing grace in all its fullness and had started to introduce rules, regulations, policies or perhaps standards of dress. They began to judge others based on how children behaved or seeing their form of what church should look like forced on others. I wonder when do we judge others? When, if we were really truly honest, if Jesus was standing right there in the midst of our conversation, would it really be what he was concerned about? Annas and Caiaphas were both bitter and jealous of Jesus, leading to a fear of losing control. Their heart is exposed for a complete lack of knowledge in the one true God who they were supposed to be teaching the people about. These men were leaders of the men who taught the people, yet they're blind as to who it was that stood before them. Next, from verses 15 on, 
we encounter Peter. A man who showed noble though flawed courage in the garden when Jesus was being arrested. A follower who was caught up in the moment. And here is a sense of hope in the midst of sadness for many of us who read this chapter. Here in all its glory is Peter's humanity. His fragility is exposed. A follower of Jesus. Another disciple who falls short. As Jesus said, they would all fall away anyway. So in what, what way is this a ray of hope? Well, I think it's a ray of hope because we know the rest of the story, don't we? His insistent denial of Jesus and make no bones about it. He was insistent in his denial. One of the gospel writers tells us that he called down curses upon himself in denying he even knew who Jesus was. His insistent denial of Jesus and subsequent realisation of what he had done leads to what? What does it lead to in Peter's life? It leads to genuine sorrow. A sorrow that led to repentance. And it's in this that you and I ought to find great comfort and hope in. Whether we're Christians or not, it's this that we can take a hold of. The issue is not whether we fall short of what we would like to be of whether we are confronted with our failings, because what's down in the well eventually comes up in the bucket in all of our lives at some point. The real question is, will you bring these things before him, acknowledging your own need and the free gift of complete, total forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus Christ? Luke says in his gospel after Peter's denial that the rooster crows. And at that moment, Jesus is able to turn and look through a window and see Peter. Their eyes lock. And Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. I confess I've experienced that look before. I think most of us have at some point. Some of us like me, perhaps more often than others. I'm not talking about the physical look so much as those times when God kind of, God's spirit kind of taps us on the shoulder. When we know we've said or done the wrong thing. When we go away feeling terrible for what we've done. How we've responded in a selfish manner at times. Got our own way at the expense of someone else. Made a promise and not kept it. Or perhaps right now you're at the end. Where do you turn? Who could possibly understand how do you make amends? How do you turn yourself around or get yourself out of the bind you find yourself in? Perhaps you see a life that's been wasted, relationships that are scarred. Is there bitterness, hurt, anger? Or perhaps you've been wronged and you just can't let that go. Loneliness that makes you wonder where to from here, particularly in the season that we're in. You know what Peter does? As he runs physically from the scene before us, Peter, in a spiritual sense, ultimately runs towards the Saviour. His response was to recognise his own shortcomings and by faith embrace the message of grace that Jesus offers. His response was not one of mere sorrow, but repentance leading to a life committed to following Jesus. Now that... that that doesn't say that Peter was perfect. We know he wasn't. The scriptures record that he, he had several times when he had to be pulled up. Being holy, not perfect, is the goal of the disciple of Jesus. Having perfection as your goal leads to all kinds of heartache, legalism and disillusionment. But seeking holiness will lead to a true appreciation of grace. What God in Christ is doing in you. It leads to dependence on him, not self. It draws us to see others as he does, not as encumbrances to our own agendas. Well, of course, the other major player in this chapter is Pilate. He's a politician. His primary concern was his own power base. Though he could see the problem, he was not prepared to do something about it. It wasn't that he was weak or too afraid. In fact, in a few years' time, he would be called back and put on trial himself in Rome for seeing that a group of Samaritans were put to death for an uprising without he himself affording them a trial. We see here the selfish ambition that James speaks of. 
There was nothing to warrant the death of Jesus, and Pilate knew it. But he was a pragmatist and believed that this would best shore up his own power base. Pilate asked the question, though, in verse 38, that is really at the heart, I believe, of this chapter. Of every one of us, whether we actually realise it or not, whether it is verbalised or even understood as such, each one of us must address the question that Pilate asks. In verse 38 there, Pilate says, What is truth? What is truth? So as we conclude, why do Matthew, Mark, Luke and John detail these final few hours? Perhaps part of it is that we might be confronted as each one of the many characters Jesus encounters in this chapter with these words. What is truth? Because all of these people thought they had it. They all thought they knew the answer to the question. For Judas, the truth was this. Jesus is not who I want him to be. I will not submit. I'm my own person. My God is, well, we know. Judas's God was money. He was a thief. He comes across as that bitter man that James describes. For Annas and Caiaphas, the truth was, we're the ones who are in the right. We will not listen or open our hearts to what is before us. Perhaps there was too much to lose. Certainly there is a refusal to submit to any authority outside of their own. Make your goal holiness, not perfection. And have that in mind as you lead and minister to others. It was their own lack of relationship with God that leads to jealousy of Jesus. They are leaders, but they didn't have Jesus' popularity, authority. They didn't have crowds following after them when they walked down the street. So much so that they would go out of their way to incite the crowd to cry out, crucify him, crucify. For Peter, the truth was he fell short. His courage had failed him. Yet in his heart, he knew the truth of Jesus' word. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Faith in the one and only Saviour produces fruit that fans the flame of the gospel in the early church. Does that not encourage you? If God uses someone who failed so profoundly, could, how could he not use you and I? Someone who millions of people through the ages have read about. And God takes him and uses him mightily in his kingdom work. For Pilate, the truth was he wanted authority, power and position. So much so that even a warning in a dream from his own wife and a burgeoning understanding of what he was hearing was not enough to change his course. His own selfish drive and ambition stood in his way. Well, what about you, friends? In the here and now, what is your truth? If you are truly honest with yourself, what is your truth? Are you like Judas, lost, disillusioned, bitter? Perhaps like Annas and Caiaphas, so tightly holding on to false hope because you are too jealous of what you have in order to consider change. Refusing to believe what's in front of them. Why hold so tightly to what you cannot keep? Surely the season we're in at the moment points to that. How unsure so much of what we hold dear really is. Perhaps you're like Pilate, who could see some form of truth to the words of Jesus, but you're too invested in your own ways to submit to him. Or like Peter, when what's down in the well comes to the fore, even though our courage, sound judgment or faith sometimes fail us. Though sometimes fear of man is greater than it should be, there is a foundation built on Christ that will restore us to himself. John has recorded the truth throughout the I am statements of Jesus. Even what we have here. Jesus did many other things that are not recorded in this book. 
but these are recorded that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you will have life in his name. What is truth, friends? Here is what John records. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes shall not hunger. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Jesus said, I am the gate, the door. Whoever enters by me will be saved. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes to me will live even though he dies. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus says, I am the vine. Whoever abides in me will bear much fruit. There is no ambiguity, no blurred lines, no gray areas when we talk about the message of the gospel. There is absolute truth. And it is to be found in Christ. Friends, will you hear and now take him at his word? Can't help but read chapters like John chapter 18 and wonder how could the people who interacted with Jesus not see him for who he was? And yet, the same message is true today. There are many people who have heard the truth, who know the truth but still stubbornly refuse to accept. If others could look into your hearts, what would they find? Sometimes the truth is we and those around us get those little glimpses as it pours out of us at certain times. But only in Christ, being led by his spirit, can we know and experience the grace and power of God to overcome. To be in the here and now what he calls us to be. Oh God, I pray that you would teach us what it means to be humble followers of Jesus. Pray for those who are listening, who are far from you, that you will call them to yourself. Those who are burnt, who are tired, who are worn out, that you would strengthen them, that your spirit would meet them and comfort them in their needs. Thank you, oh God, that Jesus came for our sakes that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that we can come to him and know we are accepted in your presence. Thank you for these good things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, friends, hey, thanks so much for taking the time to join us for our 10.30 service. Um, I hope you heard that last song, uh, the assurance that we have for those of us who know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, we pray that your heart's been stirred, that you will know that he is the truth, he is the way, he is the life. And if that is you, we'd love to get in touch with you. Could you email office at cgcc.org.au and one of the pastors would love to chat to you. Uh, if you call Canterbury home and you've been impacted by uh, the COVID-19, um, whether if you've lost your job or if you've got some challenges going on, please get in touch with us. We've set up a special email for that, covid19care at cgcc.org.au. And that's a way for us to have you communicate with us, but also for us to see how we can practically serve you in this season. And finally, uh, friends, this week we're going to have a special uh, CGCC discussions on God and finance. Now, if you're wondering, no, this is not a drumming up for more money or for the next building project or anything like that. What it is is to really get us to consider who actually shapes our finances. I had the great privilege to sit down with Scott and Denise, who call Canterbury home, and have this discussion it's going to be put up on our YouTube channel. If you don't already know, we do have a YouTube channel. There's playlists on there. You can subscribe to it, which means that as soon as something new is put up there, you'll get uh, a notification about it. Uh, we would, we're going to be putting it up there, so you can head there and uh, see the discussion. We'll also send the link out via email and also be put up on social media. So I hope it prays and serves you as a church family. To wrap up, let me read from Scripture from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless, friends. See you soon.